The first question concerns corrective feedback. Does shadowing provide corrective feedback? Apparently there are those who believe that it doesn't and assert question the value of the practice uh, because they think it does not. I'm sorry, that is entirely 100% completely wrong and anybody who asserts that basically totally misunderstands and misconceives the entire procedure and concept of shadowing, which is to give yourself constant non-stop feedback. The only way you can do shadowing is if you are doing it. Sounds like a tautology, but it's like driving a car. How do I know I can drive my car? Well, I can get into it and I can arrive at my destination without backing into a tree or ending up in a ditch or spinning out or crossing the next lane and smashing head on into an oncoming truck. I arrive at my destination. Likewise with shadowing, if you can do a decent enough approximation of the rhythm and the intonation and the, the sounds of the language that you are attempting to do it in, then that is proof that you are able to do it. Whereas if you get tongue-tied, if you stumble, if you need to stop, um, that's a sign, that's feedback, that you have some problems, some issues that you need to work on before you can arrive at that goal of being able to imitate that speech. How does that work? Well, you have earphones in your ears, so sounds are coming in here, and you are making those same sounds or attempting to make those same sounds directly on top of the sounds. The split second you hear them, a millisecond later, as, as soon as you possibly can, instantaneously make the same sounds. So you probably won't be 100% accurate, but if your system perceives yourself as being accurate, you're, you've got sound coming in here and you're making the same sound, you've got a resonance chamber in your head, that resonance chamber will harmonize, the sounds will be clear enough that you can hear the next sound and do the same thing. Whereas if you make a totally different sound, if you make a wrong sound, if you make the sound too late so that the sound you're making comes on top of the next sound, it won't harmonize. It's discordant. It will discombobulate you. That's when you have to stop. That's when the system breaks down. That's when it doesn't work. The only way you can do something like what I did in the previous video, when you make these approximations and you follow the narration, is that's the feedback. That's the green light that you have to go ahead. If you get a red light, you have to stop. In either case, that is feedback. Next question concerns shadowing and phonetics uh, specifically. Um, as a raw beginner, as a novice, if you're starting to learn a language and you know that this language has some difficult sounds in it, um, I think the example was given of Korean with its double and stressed consonants and um, of Georgian. I don't know Georgian, so I don't know what that example was, but I can think of Hindustani that has both uh, dental and, and retroflex um, consonants, whereas English only has an alveolar consonant, and so you're likely to approximate both of those to the one that's more familiar to you. And uh, what are minimal pairs in to, to speakers of these languages? Uh, you might uh, confound them. So I guess the question was, um, if you know that these are difficulties that even advanced speakers still face, uh, should you make some special allowances in trying to uh, start off shadowing these so that you don't get into the bad habit of confounding them. I would say um, you just need to do the best you can with what you have, and perhaps some of these things will work themselves out with that corrective feedback that we just discussed. But moreover, um, I'm the ultimate advocate of autodidactic study, but there's a time and a place when you need to have access to a good uh, native speaking teacher who um, understands phonetics and can explain these things to you in terms of point of articulation. Yes, no, you are making the same sound and I'm making two different sounds. My tongue is here, yours is there. You need to have these things explained to you in terms like that, that that person understands and that you understand. That's the only way that you can iron out really difficult um, pronunciation issues. But um, that said, that's not a reason to avoid doing shadowing or any other speaking practice, um, which can help you work towards these things rather than sort of um, 
being afraid to approach them. Well, the next point was more of a, um, rather than a question, was more of a comment that uh, I appreciated and would like to reinforce. And that is of sort of working for the definition of advanced shadowing for polyliterate practice uh, as having internalized and done all the things that shadowing does when you're using it as a, as a technique for learning and practicing a language. But by the time you take it to the literary level, what are you doing? I mean, you are really reading with your ears and with your tongue rather than with your eyes. And when you're doing that, you are in essence narrating. And you're narrating, ideally, you're going to take a text that is a great piece of world literature. And so many pieces of world literature were, prior to our contemporary age, were specifically designed to be narrated. So you are enjoying something, you're relishing something, a cultural product of a language um, that you have developed a good rapport with uh, in the way that I feel it was truly meant to be done. The next question concerns languages for polyliteracy. I guess in my previous video, I was trying to define polyliterates as being somehow a subset of polyglots and said you need to be a polyglot before you can be polyliterate. And this person wanted to know if that meant that he necessarily needed to be conversant in a lot of modern languages since his main interest is in dead languages. And absolutely not. There's, there's no reason whatsoever for that. I mean, you can be, have a wonderful polyliterate practice if you are totally focused on um, ancient and medieval languages. And frankly speaking, I think that would give a nice counterbalance to the number of polyglots that, to me, uh, it's almost mystifying how little interest they have in, in languages of the past. I mean, if you're going to learn languages to expand your horizons, why stay limited to the 21st century? Languages have this wonderful diachronic aspect of them if you learn languages of the past. And in the past, probably there was a lot of stuff and fluff that was in these languages as well. But what has remained uh, from languages of the past is primarily their literary traditions. So um, that's what you can find when you, when you learn medieval and ancient languages. So they've always been particularly fascinating to me in, in that regard. Um, I can't presume that everybody knows my background, so let me say it here. I mean, I, I did double major in French and German literature in college because that was where they had enough classes for me to do something with that. But I also took as much Latin and ancient Greek and Sanskrit as I could. And then in graduate school, I studied the entire range of the entire ancient Germanic and medieval Germanic language family. Uh, and I ended up writing my doctoral dissertation on mythological and religious dream symbolism in the Old Norse sagas. So um, comparing medieval Icelandic literature with uh, continental literature, medieval high German literature, uh, medieval French literature, uh, the Latin dream book tradition. So um, yes, I feel that polyliteracy is a perfect place for um, harboring a love for ancient and medieval languages. And that's where we're going to find the richest literary traditions that need to be narrated precisely in the fashion that I discussed in, in the previous segment. Then there was a question about what books one ought to use for polyliteracy, uh, specifically uh, if one had the option between taking something that was originally written in the language versus something translated into the language which might be better to use. Uh, a specific example was given for, for German. You could use Hermann Hesse's Siddhartha or a translated version of Harry Potter. Um, there is an appropriate Harry Potter stage. Uh, there are G German is a privileged language in, for English learners in that there are options. There are books that are translated from German into English as well as from English into German. Um, for a large number of languages out there in the world, unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, so uh, the international publishing um, 
firms have, have just made it so that, I don't know, you, you're going to inevitably end up reading Harry Potter and Sherlock Holmes and Jules Verne and, and a number of other things that have become standard works um, as you approach real literacy in, uh, in, in world languages. But um, the sooner you can get to the Hermeneses of this world, I think the better. Um, the whole purpose is to enjoy the, the cultural products of the language that you are you have you put so much time and effort into mastering and so i think that in in this case of something like german that you might have your your harry potter stage would be all right when you are um, a high intermediate uh learner but uh, when you're crossing the stage uh to take up the mantle of of polyliteracy then the time has come to put that kind of thing behind you and to work with to the highest degree um, with original products of that language. Then there were a number of questions about looking at texts while you shadowed, uh, whether it's a good idea to, to shadow and, uh, and read at the same time, or um, whether it's okay in the kind of uh, demonstration that I did last time uh, where you have numerous languages but you're doing the same text in them to say just read the text in your target language uh, and uh, then come to know it really well and dispense with it ultimately so um, yes uh, again uh, it's been 10 years since since I made it or really looked at it myself but in sort of I think it was shadowing step by step a lengthy video that I made and some other forums that I wrote about it I talked about about nine or different nine or ten different stages of shadowing from blind shadowing at the beginning to really internalizing the, the whole text at the end and there are several stages of shadowing when it's um, perfectly logical and good and appropriate to to look at a text as you do it um, and there that's a that's a very fine way to really learn how to, to read aloud uh, with, with feeling and intonation when you have a good narration to to follow along with it <clears throat> um, but uh, all of that said ultimately uh, how do you know when you are really advanced when you've really mastered the language when you really have the feel of it is I think when you can to a high degree uh, dispense with the need to look at a text with your eyes and just be able to hear the text with your ears and to say the text with feeling and complete understanding with your tongue. Then there was a question about how many languages you needed to know in order to sort of employ the technique that I demonstrated last time of transferring your understanding from a language in which you had literal comprehension through a language in which you had some but less literal comprehension ultimately to a language in which you did not yet have that literal comprehension. And uh, in that video, I used six languages, uh, two that I had high literal comprehension in, two in which I had literal comprehension, but not as high as in those previous two, and then ultimately two languages in which I, I didn't have any literal comprehension. Um, and so this person here is uh, a native Spanish speaker, and he has learned English and Italian well, and now he's learning French. and. I guess he's asking, do I think it would work for him to try this exercise at this point? And I don't know. I would say, give it a try. I think there's a high possibility that it will work because all of these languages are highly related. Uh, English is not a Romance language genetically, but more of its vocabulary comes from Romance languages than 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 from other sources. And so there's an incredibly high degree of overlap of vocabulary and structure. Obviously, if you're a native Spanish speaker and you have Italian, I think that that, that transfer will come a lot more rapidly with uh, French, uh, particularly if you have English there as a bridge. So um, give it a try and let me know. That question segues nicely into the next one, which is whether it would be a valid endeavor to attempt to learn a language just by this transfer of understanding process. That is just by um, doing what I did in the previous video, taking a, a text uh, in the same 
language, uh, same text in, in multiple languages and, and running through it from literal comprehension to less literal comprehension to no literal comprehension, but still retaining the meaning. Um, and so uh, would that be a valid endeavor? Of course, I think that probably through most of human history, that's basically the, how people learned languages. If they didn't have an understanding of grammar or right, the concept of, of phonetics or, or anything, just communicating with, with other people when they're thrown into a new context of, of I don't know, being enslaved or cast away and you find yourself among a, 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 a totally different language. You just have to imitate it and learn it in that fashion. So that's probably what people have done. Now, did they learn it well? Or did they always speak a broken language? As I said in my previous video, I think that you ultimately you would ideally want to get a, a grammar book out and, uh, and, and look things up if you could, which you could with, I use the example of Aramaic, but I was also pointing you to that site where I think they've got something like maybe 2000 audio New Testaments and probably 15 or 1800 of those are from languages in which you probably won't be able to find a grammar book or any other reference or resource. That's the beautiful thing about that. They're translations into, into the widest variety of, of African and Central American, South American languages. Um, so this is probably the only source you're going to find. And so you might not have any choice uh, if you really wanted to, to learn one of these languages, but just to throw yourself wholeheartedly into this attempt to, to transfer the understanding process, given a text that you, you know. So um, that, yeah, that, that could be totally valid. Uh, but if you had the option to, um, to uh, to have recourse to a grammar book that would certainly make the process much, much more uh, efficacious and, and, and rapid. Uh, and ultimately, I think you would definitely end up having a better comprehension than if this is all that you did. Um, the reason I chose um, Aramaic, among other things, but apart from being a scholarly language of the Middle East, is because it is um, a sister language to Arabic. In Arabic, I, I spent nine years of my life immersed in, in Arabic-speaking countries and, and another decade or 15 years outside of Arabic-speaking countries studying it very intensively, and I still read it and listen to it every day. And I'll, I'll never be like a native speaker, but I've, I've developed a high feel for the, the language and, and, and everything. And so when I go to a sister language, I hear similar words, I hear similar structure. I, I have enough hooks to hang things on that, um, as I said, if, if I just took that Aramaic text that I shadowed last time and it were given to me cold out of the blue, I had no idea what it was, I probably would know that it's a Bible text. I'm sure I would, um, but I couldn't tell you what I wouldn't certainly be able to translate anything. I wouldn't been, I wouldn't have had that that transfer of understanding process. Um, but I, I have enough hooks. I would hear words. I would hear things. I hear, I hear the structure that I could do it with that. Whereas with so many of those fascinating sounding African and and Central American and um, and and other languages from around the world where there are no hooks, um, that would definitely be a fascinating but very difficult challenge. Finally, there was a question about time blocks for shadowing, whether it's better to do them in a concentrated larger chunks or to break them into smaller chunks and to uh, distribute them throughout your day. The presupposition here seems to be that you are sold on the concept and the practice of, of shadowing is a valid thing to do and you have say 90 minutes or two hours to devote to it per day and maybe three or four languages so you could do 30 minutes back to back for two hours or you could do 15 minutes at a time throughout the day um, all day long. I don't know that there's a one-size-fits-all answer for this, but I'm going to attempt it along the lines of when you're learning a language, when it's for the, the, the learning stages, if it's possible, if your lifestyle allows you to continue returning to it, then the breaking it into smaller chunks and having it be distributed throughout the day will keep you really focused on the learning process, will keep things fresher in your memory and uh, 
probably help that that learning go along so if your lifestyle allows you to do that then i think that's worth a try um but when you get to a poly literate practice and your goal is to personally narrate a great piece of literature in a language that you have uh, you're approaching real mastery in and, and good literal comprehension in uh, and your goal is to narrate it with feeling then i would say that a if you're capable of sitting and doing it for long periods of time um, you're probably going to enjoy that a bit more um, you'll get into the meaning of the text and and if it's not a strain on you to do it for a longer period of time that is probably preferable. I do think that a polyliterate practice does have things in common with, say, something like yoga, where you might want to do some of the, the asanas, the physical stretching. You might want to do some meditation or contemplative practice. You might want to do some pranayama or breathing exercises as different aspects of your yoga practice. And that's something that you would probably sit and, and do in back to back to back early in the morning to set the tone for your whole day and i think that that's true too of a polyliterate practice when you're going to really sort of put your mind and your heart ideally back as to take a lot of threads that i talked about today to in a diachronic strand to go back and and really uh, personally narrate uh, a great work of literature from from some past civilization um it's nice to be focused and concentrated on that for a protracted period of time if you can do that. So I think that that answers most of the questions and substantive comments that came into my video on, on advanced shadowing and particularly the practice of transferring understanding from languages in which you had high literal comprehension through little languages in which you had less to languages in which you had none. Uh, I probably will make other videos about shadowing at some point in the future because it is one of my main techniques, but my other main technique, which has not received as much um, attention and which a lot of you who enjoy listening to me talk about my experience with languages and try to share it with you so as to make your journey easier, um, have asked me to move on to my topic of scriptorium. And so that is what I will do uh, in my next video. Um, I think this format in which we're falling into is good. I'll make a video uh, once a week and then uh, take comments and questions to it uh, and make a follow-up video about that. Uh, I know people can watch videos at any point. I'll still make a point of answering some things, but I don't want to put uh, substantive um, writing into a YouTube comment box. I think it's very hard for people to find and to see and to have have that be a resource for other people. So I've mentioned numerous times now, uh, I am doing my uh, technophobic best, uh, my uh, old man sort of difficult incompetence with modern technology to set up a new website uh, in where there will be a question and answer um, section that will be nicely indexed and all these kind of questions will be there to be uh, found uh, for anybody who comes after the fact to to look at them and find them much more easily. So if uh, interesting, somebody sees these videos after we've made and talked about the question and answer section, um, then we'll refer them to that upcoming website. Thank you very much for your interest and for listening and um, goodbye.